Mr. Sikorski, thank you for being uh, with me and my, our viewers on uh, my show Counter Commentary. Let's start straight to the point. How did the world change in uh, 2022? The most obvious answer probably is related to Russia's invasion in Ukraine, but still there are many questions that remain. Uh, for example, the climate change, this is probably the arguably the largest, you know, the big uh, partisan gap in uh, public uh, discussions, debates, international relationship, relationships, etc. Also the power of China. So how do you think the historians will look at the 20, uh, 2020, uh, 2022 in course of time, in due course of time? I don't regard myself as an expert on climate change, but it looks like China may have peaked as regards its economy and its... Um, uh, power uh, of innovation, um, but I but I think still the war in Ukraine will be seen as the big event because um, it has exposed the weakness of Russia and the unsuspected uh, unity of the Western world. Um, and if uh, Ukraine wins this war, as I expect it will, um, this will have uh, enormous consequences for the relationship between West and, uh, and Russia and, and the West and China. Um, it, it's, it's a test of uh, systems, remember. Ukraine is fighting a free, a pro-Western um, kind of citizens' war, uh, and Russia is fighting as a, a, a corrupt dictatorship. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even though Ukraine is much smaller, it's resisting very successfully. Okay, uh, the president of Ukraine, uh, Mr. Zelensky, he is visiting right now uh, United States. He has a, he, he, he gave a speech uh, in front of the uh, American Congress. He met with the President Biden. So um, how does, in your opinion, the war, the war of Russia against Ukraine changes the world order? In what aspects? What's your comment on that? Well, I think um, uh, uh, President Zelensky has gone to uh, Washington at a very good moment. Namely, you still have a, a, a Democrat-dominated House of Representatives, but the Republicans are, are taking over control in January. And I think this is a way of trying to solidify American support. Uh, the U.S. has spent already $50 billion uh, this year. Similar sums are being planned for next year. We are doing something similar in Europe. Um, we thought Russia was a, a sort of smaller China, whereas Russia is turning out to be a larger Iran and actually um, has to go cap in hand for uh, Iranian uh, uh, weapons, drones and ammunition. Um, uh, so I think this, this war and the consequences of uh, the sanctions that are, that are uh, beginning to hurt the Russian economy will degrade Russia for a decade or so. Okay, but still, if we speak about, in, in a perspective, about the peace after the war, uh, there are at least two points which need to be addressed. One of them is uh, the dominant, not dominant, but, you know, it can be heard, the opinion that uh, it should be gone through a process of negotiation. Any war, some people say, ends at the table of negotiation. If we recall the history, Germany, the Nazi Germany, they unconditionally uh, surrendered and capitulated after the end of the World War II. So what's your answer to this question? We should negotiate because any war, every war will end up in a negotiation process, in a diplomacy, uh, talks, etc. I think you're right that the Second World War was exceptional in that um, Germany just capitulated, but but it only did when the, the Red Army conquered Berlin. And I don't expect Ukraine to conquer uh, Moscow. Moscow, yeah. Um, so, uh, so normally wars end when both sides are sufficiently exhausted. I think the closest parallel uh, to this one is the uh, Russo-Japanese War of 1904. Uh, Russia attacked uh, what was regarded as a smaller adversity, adversity lost, and there was a peace and mm -hmm. negotiated by President Roosevelt of, of the United States. Um, Putin still thinks he can win. 
uh, he will only negotiate realistically when he realizes he cannot win. And we are not that at that point yet. Mm -hmm. And if, not if, when we come to the point of negotiation, uh, hopefully the victory will be with Ukraine, uh, then another question comes up. And this is not solely my point. It's an uh, opinion expressed by the former uh, Greek uh, finance minister, Mr. Varoufakis. Um, it's hardly, it's, it's difficult to imagine that Polish, Scandinavian, Baltic leaders will cede their roles in the negotiation to Germany, France, for example. So that's the question. Is the European Union sufficient in its efforts, diplomatic, economical and uh, war uh, military efforts to support Ukraine? And who will lead from European part this negotiation process, hopefully sooner than later? I remember uh, uh, debating with, the, with Mr. Varoufakis, he's a colorful figure, uh, uh, and I think he's right on this. Um, the uh, previous time uh, in the Minsk process, it was Germany and France which took it upon themselves uh, and lost, and, um, and it was a failure. Um, uh, this time we uh, will insist that our interests, the interests of neighbors of both Russia and Ukraine, are paramount and, and that at the very least we abide by the Lisbon Treaty which says that the EU should have a policy in common. Um, in other words, it should be the role of the high representative for foreign and, and defense policy or the president of the council rather than a self-appointed group of member states. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then another question is, uh whether the Germany learned its lessons from historic, historical uh, perspective. They use this expression uh, Zeit and Wende or uh, paradigm shift or turning point, I would say. Uh, if I bring you back to year 2007, the famous uh, Putin speech in Munich on this uh, security conference at that time, uh, since that time seems Europe, European Union, European Western Uni European politicians, they are missing the point. Are they still missing the point? I think the Germans are, are evolving in the, the right direction, but too slowly. I'm told that uh, not a single euro of the 100 billion euros that were announced for defense has yet been spent. Um, Germany claims to be a major uh, a military aid donor to Ukraine, but we don't know the details. And some stories of German equipment failing are, are not good. Um, uh, Western Europe in general has completely disarmed itself. You know, Poland has given Ukraine 200 tanks, yet we still have more tanks than Germany, France and Britain put together. Um, there's also uh, the question of uh, burden sharing. You know, it shouldn't be that Poland, Scandinavia, Baltic states, Romania, maybe Bulgaria uh, in the Black Sea, that we should be bearing the cost of deterring Putin so that richer countries in Western Europe can spend half the percentage of GDP on defense that we do. Um, you know, if, if we recognize that Putin is a threat to all of Europe, which he is, then we should be deterring that threat uh, proportionally, mm -hmm. um, in proportion to GDP, i.e. through the EU defense budget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, speaking of the burden of the cost, you know, the price, do you think the Europe will come to the point of uh, doubting, is this the price we have to pay? What will you answer to any politician from the left, for example, who says it's too high price, we should not pay it, we should give to our people instead, you know, because crisis, because of the uh, COVID uh, consequences, etc. So is there any point of this price is too high for us to pay? Well, we are a 15 trillion euro, euro economy as the European Union. 15 trillion. 15,000 billion. <laughs> I see, I know. I know. Yeah. Um, this war has cost us um, uh, up to 50 billion this year. Mm -hmm. And we have just voted in the European Parliament 18 billion for next year. 
Mm-hmm. Um, we can afford it. Uh, Russia has the economy of uh, Italy, maybe less now. Uh, you're right that wars are eventually won by economic might, by production, by logistics. Uh, <laughs> as the West, um, the EU plus the United States, we're 18 times richer than, than Russia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we can afford it much more than them. Okay, we can afford it. That's that's a, that's a good, you know, that's an optimistic saying from your side. On the other side, you can be heard saying that uh, if we do not stop Russia in Ukraine now, you may have to stop it on Polish borders or any other European country's borders. Do you still think this is, is this a form of speech, so to say, or it's a, mm, a real threat to Europe? And how do you explain it in a few words? Well, when Putin was threatening Ukraine in Beach in uh, Munich that you've already mentioned, uh, most uh, listeners uh, thought that this is too nuts. It, it, it can't be true. That's just playing up to uh, domestic agenda. Yet he was perfectly um, honest with us. Uh, his uh, propagandists now talk about nuking uh, European cities. Uh, we can't exclude the possibility that they mean it this time as well. Uh, these, this is a fascistic, aggressive, uh, genocidal regime um, that I hope will be transformed into something better as a result of a lost war. There is a long um, a tradition of that in Russia. And certainly I prefer Putin's uh, 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 tanks to be a thousand kilometers away from the Polish border than on the Polish border. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, back to the history. In uh, 2011, in Berlin, in your speech addressing the audience then, you said that you fear more German inactivity than German power. What's your perspective on that fears today? Well, I feel exactly the same. You know, we, we are not being threatened by German militarism. We, 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 we think there is not enough German commitment to, to defense, right? Mm-hmm. That's exactly, fits exactly right. Um, Germany needs to um, uh, um, take responsibility as the largest country in the EU for the largest crisis on our borders in, in decades. Um, uh, and it's not, not, not enough uh, anymore to only have uh, industrial and trade policy. Uh, Germany, through European institutions, should be helping to shape um, a proper foreign and security policy. Okay, as a politician, a former foreign minister of Poland. Uh, I have at the end of our conversation one or two political, philosophical, so uh, better to say, questions. Um, people say that uh, Putin is too much into dates. Just in a few days, two, one or two days, we will celebrate, so to say, a uh, hundred uh, years of uh, establishment of uh, Soviet Union the uh, Union of Soviet Socialistic Republics. So do you think it's a political cliche Putin uses, you know, or he really thinks and acts so that he will establish at one point, re-establish at one point, if not in a political terms, then at least in ge- ge- geographical terms, the, 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 the uh, powerness and uh, uh, mightiness of uh, Soviet Union that, at that time, from that time. Oh, I think he's absolutely um, uh, serious about it. I knew he would invade Ukraine when I read that essay he published in July last year, where he put together all imperialist myths about Russia and Ukraine from the time of the Tsars, from the time of the Bolsheviks, uh, and now. He's not a trained historian. historian. He, He might even believe in all this nonsense. Um, and it's, he thinks he's Peter the Great Mark too. Uh, I mean, he talks about yes, it, you know, yes. you saw, did you see his drunken uh, little 
um, speech, remark. Yeah, with a with a glass um, of champagne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what he he thinks he's doing. He's, you know, in his third decade in power, he has no one around him who will tell him like it is. Um, he thinks he's um, uh, fighting for his place in Russian history. Uh, whereas, in fact, he's just a gambler who's run, whose luck has run out. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. he's made, um, instead of a, a, a reconqueror of the Russian Empire, he will be its, uh, its, its final grave digger. Mm -hmm. And um, the Russian elites need to acknowledge that the, the, the project of rebuilding the empire, um, for which 100,000 young Russians have already um, uh, lost their lives is simply not worth it. They are treading down the, the, the trodden path of all other European empires uh, with, uh, who, who've tried to hold on to their colonies for too long. Okay, so I'm pretty much sure that you have addressed either from the um, officially in the European Parliament or in a private personal conversations with the European uh, members of European Parliament, but uh, still how would you respond to a person who says, uh, especially in the context that European Parliament recently adopted a resolution uh, announcing Russia as a state sponsoring terrorism. So some Bulgarian left uh, politicians there in the European Parliament, and not only them, abstained or voted against this resolution. So again, a final comment on a so-called call for neutrality. What's your response to that? Well, you shouldn't be neutral between evil and freedom. Um, the Ukrainians are fighting for their existence as a nation. The Russians are trying to uh, degrade them to the status of, of Russian folklore, but to deny them the, the right to be a separate culture, separate nation, separate state, <laughs> and a separate ambition to join the, the European Union. Um, I was not happy with that resolution either, but for a different reason. Um, when the Russians send death squads, squads to, to Germany, to Denmark, to, to Britain, um, they are not being state sponsors of terrorism. They are actually a terrorist state. Yes. And in another definition of being a terrorist state is to be targeting civilians during armed conflict. And mm -hmm. that's clearly what the Russians what happens are doing. Now, yeah. so, they are not, so they are not sponsors of terrorism. They are a terrorist state. And that's uh, and and what we still need to do is to um, make legal arrangements uh, to parallel those in the United States, whereby the the victims of um, uh, state terrorism should be able to be satisfied in their claims from the frozen assets of the of the terrorist yeah. state. Yes, in other words, Ukraine and Ukrainians should be able to draw on the 300 billion uh, euros that that we have frozen um, uh, in our banks of Russian state assets. Including uh, almost uh, 20, 20 billion uh, euro of uh, Russian oligarchs. Do you have in Poland, do you, do you in Poland have uh, problems with uh, Russian propaganda, pro-Russian uh, politicians? Pol Poland is exemplary country for its support to Ukraine. I admire that and, you know, congratulations for that. So do you have still, do you have yeah. problems with Russian propaganda there and political influence? We do. And we have Russian agents of influence, uh, mostly on the extreme right, uh, actually, not on mm -hmm. the extreme left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but remember, today's Russia doesn't count on being liked. Uh, what, they, what they spread is cynicism, uh, is, um, is false equivalence. Uh, and bringing down everybody to their own level. Uh, so, yeah, sure, well, we are a corrupt dictatorship, but you're no better. That's their method. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a lot of it, but I think they, uh, in the West, they lost the uh, argument. Uh, they've been more successful in the global south. Last question regarding Bulgaria and the admission always postponed admission of Bulgaria in the Schengen zone. As a European politician, as a former uh, foreign minister of Poland, 
where I don't I don't want, expect you to say you're perfect. Uh, where do you think Bulgaria fails to fulfill the requirements for being admitted to Schengen zone? And that's our last question. Well, I'll also say it as a former holiday maker in, in Bulgaria. In the 1970s, we uh, spent a very happy childhood holidays at the uh, Nestinarka campsite near Michurin. Michurin, yes. <laughs> now it Michurin, has the other name, but yeah. yes, we know it. Yeah. I know, I know, but I remember it as Michurin, uh, <laughs> close to the Turkish border. Um, and uh, we could travel then um, uh, without visas um, and without uh, much control. And I think it's unfair for countries to be uh, vetoing uh, things for domestic political uh, uh, reasons Perfect. Yeah. when all the criteria have long been fulfilled. Re it really is unfair. When uh, Orban uh, blocks aid for Ukraine because he wants to extract uh, money from the EU, um, uh, you know, countries should be voting on the matter at hand rather than blackmailing others for their particular reasons. Bulgaria uh, deserve, has deserved to be a full member of Schengen Zone for some years now, and I hope you achieve it soon. Thank Christmas. you. Uh, I also wish you a very bright Hello. and blissful Christmas and very success successful New Year to you and your family. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.